Well, excellent. Um, we're going to go ahead and get started. It's about six o'clock. Uh, I'd like to welcome you all to the 2021 Sportsman's Forum. Uh, my name is Craig Highfield. Uh, I'm with the Alliance for the Chesapeake Bay. And uh, tonight is the third part of our Sportsman's Forum series. Uh, we're going to take a little turn today uh, off the land uh, uh, into the water. Last week we covered wild turkey, and next week we're going to uh, talk about white-tailed deer. Uh, but today we're going to actually go into our streams and talk about the iconic uh, brook trout. Uh, so we have two speakers with us today. So I'm going to start uh, in Maryland, and we'll move our way across the Mason-Dixon to talk about Pennsylvania. But uh, speaking in Maryland, we have uh, Dan Getz. He's a statewide operations manager for freshwater fisheries program at Maryland Department of Natural Resources. Um, so go ahead, uh, Jen, if you can stop sharing and, and Dan, you can start sharing your presentation. Uh, just as we're getting set up, uh, like anything, if you have questions um, about anything that we're talking about today, feel free to throw them in the chat. After Dan talks today, uh, we'll open up the questions. Um, and then before Dave uh, continues. Sorry, Craig, are you ready for me to start? Yes, go ahead. Thanks, Sam. Uh, sorry. Like Craig said, I'm Dan Getz. I'm the statewide operations man uh, manager for Maryland Department of Natural Resources, Freshwater Fisheries. And I oversee our cold water program which is run by our cold water specialists and brook trout specialists. And today I'm just gonna give you a uh, overview of the brook trout population status and trends in Maryland and an uh, overview of our program goals and objectives and how we're trying to achieve progress on the ground for brook trout habitat restoration. So just a uh, real quick background, uh, brook trout conservation in Maryland is generally guided by the brook trout fisheries management plan, which was adopted in 2006 and authored by Heft et al. The primary goal is to restore and maintain healthy brook trout populations in Maryland's freshwater streams and provide long-term social and economic benefits from a recreational fishery. Uh, currently, if you look at the map below, we have 317 known occupied catchments in the state. Those are highlighted in blue. Uh, the green polygons or shaded areas, those are other wild trout resources such as browns and rainbows. And in total, that encompasses about 1,017 square kilometers and approximately 854 stream miles. Uh, brook trout resources in Maryland are protected by adhering to existing cold water regulations uh, through Maryland's water quality standards, policies, and participating in environmental review. And cold water resources in Maryland fall under what's known as use class three protection. So if a stream um, does not exceed 20 degrees C for more than 10% of the time from June 1st to August 30th, those streams are granted cold water protection if they have other biological indicators such as wild trout reproduction or sensitive macroinvertebrate uh, insects. So anyway, my point to that is streams that are under that protection um, get more stringent reviews for habitat projects and um, construction projects. Brook trout habitat improvement projects are pursued and supported regularly by staff in order to restore and improve previously degraded ha habitats. Brook trout reintroduction efforts are currently underway in watersheds where they were previously extirpated, but the existing habitat and or water quality appears adequate to reintroduce trout. A couple examples of this are a band, banded coal mine, um, impacted streams through AMD mitigation, and streams where cattle fencing or riparian forest buffers have been planted and improved overall habitat and water quality. Brook Trout Program staff are active members of both the Eastern Brook Trout Joint Venture and Southern Division of the American Fisheries Society Trout Committee. And the last bullet point here I wanna highlight because that's kind of what's driving our program goals is Maryland is a signatory partner in the Chesapeake Bay Agreement, which includes a brook trout conservation and restoration as a vital ha habitats goal. And that calls for an 8% increase in occupied habitat by 2025. And that was signed into law by, or signed by our Governor Hogan in 2014. So in order to, to reach progress towards that Chesapeake Bay goal of 8%, we first had to establish a baseline of our known brook trout resources. So starting in 2014, our brook trout program staff and regional fishery staff uh, set out on a five-year statewide survey of all known brook trout populations dating back to 1987. In total, there were 456 documented catchments across the state 
And over those five years from 2014 to 2018, we were able to sample 440 of those. So approximately 96% completion rating. Um, after the end of the, oops, after the end of the survey in 2018, uh, we observed an apparent 27% loss statewide. Those are indicated by the red polygons and the map below. In our Western region, so the left of the map, which is Garrett and Allegheny counties, we lost almost 15% of our streams. Uh, Frederick and Washington counties there in the middle, which is the Catoctin Mountains, saw nearly a 21% decline. In our central region, all the way to the right of the map, where Baltimore and Carroll counties, we lost nearly 50%. And just to note, our central region population is um, the southernmost Piedmont brook trout population in the country. So it's, it's right on the fringe of climate change and land use, as well as urbanization with um, the growing population there. So this, of course, was not good use. So it really um, spurred the brook trout program and our regional fishery staff to kind of take a new trajectory towards brook trout conservation. So we, we set out on a new conservation framework, which included three pillars. Uh, the first one is resiliency. So focusing those watersheds that will provide the greatest opportunity for brook trout persistence in the future. These are our best of the best strongholds, areas where we have good populations of fish where habitat projects on the ground will um, knowingly result in improved brook trout habitat. So we, we wanna focus our resources in the areas where we know we're actually gonna improve brook trout. Uh, the second pillar is protection. This is ongoing. This covers all our, our brook trout streams, even the marginal ones that we're um, perceivably losing. Uh, with this involves working with MDE and other partners through providing environmental reviews to ensure stormwater infrastructure, construction projects, habitat projects do not further degrade cold water habitat. And again, this falls in line with use class three protection that I mentioned earlier. And the third pillar is restoration. This involves both habitat improvement projects as well as identifying candidate streams where temperature, water quality, habitat, and land use conditions are now suitable for reintroduction. And I'll touch on all these throughout this talk. So the first pillar focuses on resiliency. In order to um, support this pillar, we first had to really quantify our existing patches across the state. So in 2020, we conducted a um, qualitative patch assessment of our remaining fisheries. Uh, this involves setting five criteria that we developed through literature search, as well as pillars held by other um, Salmon and conservation groups, such as EBTJV. Uh, the five criteria were allopatry, uh, so a brook trout cannot coexist with another non-native Salmonid uh, to get that check. We also wanna see public land ownership within the watershed. This is to indicate high forest cover through state forests or state park programs, but as well as offering public angling opportunities since we are a, an angler funded um, agency. Uh, we also looked at abundance and this is based on long-term monitoring data. So any stream that was above the 75th percentile um, for abundance got a check for that in terms of overall population size. The fourth one was diversity of spawning stock or N sub E effective population size. And the last one was private land conservation easement. So streams that were on private land, uh, we wanted to see um, property owners that were either already enrolled in conservation easements or other land habitat um, um, programs. So patches that met four of the five criteria were considered resilient and are emphasized as priority habitat restoration areas. Restoration areas and these are indicated in the green rows below of the table. Statewide, there were 10 streams that met for this criteria. And this patch assessment really opened our eyes to data gaps that were missing on several other streams. So some streams, we just didn't have enough data, either enough years of abundance or genetic information to complete the patch assessment. So subsequent sampling through our brook trout monitoring program is going to be based on filling in these needed data gaps so we can have a more comprehensive overview of, this, of our state resources. Uh, so why a re resiliency? Uh, it's, it's an applied approach. Again, it's the best of the best. These are areas where brook trout are thriving. So any habitat improvement in that watershed is going to result in increased habitat for the resource. Um, it enables us to target watersheds for public land acquisition. So if we have a quality resource with limited public access or less than desirable forest cover, we can you know, reach out to our, our land um, group to see about acquiring land within these watersheds. 
allows us to work with local jurisdictions and landowners to target stream sections for habitat restoration and conservation easements. So these are parcels where we, we've identified within stronghold watersheds that are lacking riparian buffers or cattle exclusion devices. And just to note, currently within all of our brook trout patches in the state, um, so if you take a, a 50 meter buffer zone or about 150 feet to either side of the stream along all of our stream miles in the state, we have, I have that in hectares, but that's about 30,000 acres of unforested um, land just in our brook trout resources. And at a cost of around $6,500, we're talking $96 million to fully reforest the buffer zones within these brook trout resources. So that's the, the magnitude of land use issues we're dealing with in Maryland. Um, it also helps us identify connectivity issues within the watershed. So if we have a robust population, but a low genetic diversity or spawning stock, we can identify you know, barriers to, to uh, movement to allow for an increase in, in genetic diversity to ensure that that population will not become inbred and extirpated through time. And we're currently looking into genetic rescue projects as we speak. There was a uh, two-day Eastern Brook Trout Genetics Workshop just held a few weeks ago. So there's supposed to be a, a supporting document coming out of that to help inform state agencies for uh, genetic concerns related to brook trout. And this is just a quick land use table of the 10 watersheds that were identified as, as our resilient patches. Um, the, the upper half is land use within the entire watershed and the bottom half is land use within just a 50 meter buffer. And I circled two um, just to kind of paint the picture of you know, the degradation in our central region where we saw the greatest declines in brook trout resources. So the upper Gunpowder River, which is above Pretty Boy Reservoir uh, on the map there to the right, um, less than half of, or around half of that watershed is currently occupied with brook trout and half are not. Those are indicated in black circles. And riparian forest coverage within the watersheds is less than 50%. We want to see over 65% to support brook trout. So there's a lot of restoration opportunities in this part of the state in one of our strongholds. So I just wanted to point that out. Uh, moving on to the second pillar, which is protection. Um, actually, I already moved on to that, didn't I? No, this is the first slide. Okay, so <laughs> after uh, the, the uh, patch assessment, the five-year survey, um, we kind of had a, several staff meetings, bounced around some conservation measures that we thought we needed to take. Um, and there was a mixed feeling on uh, catch and release regulations statewide for brook trout. Uh, so we kind of agreed on a hybrid plan. So in 20, starting January 1st, 2020, uh, Maryland passed uh, catch and release brook trout regulations for all waters east of Interstate 81. So that kept, cuts off our Western two counties, uh, which is our high elevation. Most of our strongholds are there. Anything east of there, you have to release brook trout. West of there in the gray shaded region, um, you can still harvest brook trout, but not if it's in a put and take stream. And the reason for that is we don't stock brook trout in Maryland. We only stock browns and rainbows. So we didn't want in unintentional harvest of brook trout in our stock streams that would have more than normal angling pressure because of the stock resource there. So um, as far as um, resource protection, our, our uh, angling regulations are about as restrictive as they can be. And just to note, this is not a, a fishing Fishing regulation issue, the losses we're seeing, it, it's a land use issue, but we just wanted to make it known that brook trout resources are struggling and anglers need to do as much as they can to help preserve the resource and just bring awareness to the overall situation. Um, uh, we have ongoing review processes uh, for mine and water withdrawal permitting, habitat projects and infrastructure projects just to minimize thermal issues, sediment runoff issues, you know, water withdrawals, et cetera. Um, we're working with MDE, Maryland Department of Environment. That's our sister agency to develop uh, thermal best management practice guidelines for dams, um, impounded stormwater surface waters, uh, just to be able to treat um, any surface storage water that might overflow into a cold water stream um, to, to reduce the temperatures and protect these resources. Again, the central part of the state, our most urban area saw the biggest declines um, during the five-year survey. And we're actively strategically targeting streams for temperature and biological data. 
um, to help get use class three protection on streams that are kind of borderline but aren't already under that protection. Uh, we've been having several discussions with Maryland Department of Forestry related to brook trout buffer prioritization and planting. Um, we've been providing lists of parcels, so private land um, properties where um, buffer zones are not forested or there's issues with livestock grazing down to the stream or, or running through the stream. And, and we're providing that to the counties to hopefully contact landowners and get them enrolled into um, EQIP or CREP programs to uh, improve habitat there. Um, we're working with MD as well on thermal TMDLs. Um, this is a new thing for Maryland. I believe Maryland's the only state doing it. Um, but any county that has an MS4 permit will soon be required to meet uh, temperature TMDLs per the use class three designation. And again, use class three states, it cannot exceed um, 20 degrees more than 10% of the time from June 1 to August 30th. And restoration, um, the last pillar. Again, Chesapeake Bay Agreement calls for an 8% increase in brook trout habitat by 2025. To meet that goal, we need approximately 42 square kilometers. Um, so far, we've successfully reintroduced one, which was Weinbrenner Run uh, through AMD mitigation in Western Maryland. And that was about 20% of our goal. So we are making some progress. However, as you noticed during the five-year survey, we've lost 27%. So that baseline keeps moving downward. We also have six candidate streams for potential reintroductions that we conducted temperature and habitat surveys on this summer. Um, we should have that wrapped up here in the next few weeks on determining whether or not we're gonna pursue reintroductions with them. But if by chance they all are suitable candidates, that's another 51 square kilometers of um, streams to include towards our Chesapeake Bay goal. Um, decisions to reintroduce are gonna be based on habitat suitability, temperature, as well as water quality and source stocks. So if we're going to translocate fish from other streams, we're going to consider genetic diversity, which is where the N sub E came in from the patch assessment uh, with the goal of subsequent year classes or new, newly spawned fish of just being genetically fit um, so that we don't have to keep managing these resources intensively. So I've, I've given you a spiel of the brook trout program, talked about our monitoring data, the status of the brook trout fishery and in, in our kind of our framework forward for progress. But the question is, how do we translate all this information into actual progress on the ground? Um, first thing, you have to be able to understand what actually makes a brook trout stream. And if you're an angler, if you spent more than a minute fishing any trout stream, it's pretty obvious to the naked eye. I mean, a couple of things that jump out is canopy cover and shading. This helps lower stream temperatures, supports woody debris in the stream for habitat, as well as leaf litter to support the food chain. Uh, we also want to see a diversity of habitat uh, through small and large woody debris, different sized boulders, as well as cobbles, just to support spawning, reproduction, and all life stages of brook trout. And we also want to see a good mixture of pools, riffles, and runs uh, in the stream. Again, this, this indicates, you know, uh, habitat for all life stages of brook trout. Question is, you know, we know what this looks like, but can we measure it, quantify it, and, and and generate this information in a way that's useful for to inform management decisions and inform policy and implementation to actually achieve progress on the ground. So one method, one approach we've taken to do this is to model the data we have. Um, we, our sister, our partner group, they're not within freshwater fisheries, but the Maryland Biological Stream Survey does statewide assessments of all non-tidal streams across the state, not just brook trout streams. Um, and these are random survey designs on five to 10 year rotations. And they collect a suite of habitat, land use, flow, temperature, as well as biological data um, at each stream that they sample. So I, I went into their database and was able to obtain over 1,100 individual stream records with all this data. And I just modeled it um, using a, what's called a regression tree. And I'm, I'll go into these figures here in a second, but it's just an approach to look at all the variables and how it relates to whatever you're trying to predict. So in this case, I'm trying to predict whether or not a stream has brook trout in it or not. Um, so long story short, we ran this cart model and the figure to the left, which is a bunch of vertical straight lines and numbers and names, it's called a regression tree. So I'm, I'm gonna highlight a couple of these indicators of of brook trout presence. Um, starting at the top, the biggest one is altitude or elevation. 
So any stream that was, is over 270 meters or roughly 1,000 feet in elevation, you move to the right if it had a quality riffle score above nine, low row crop coverage and high in-stream epiphonal substrate, that's another name for habitat, greater than 13, 149 streams met this criteria, 93% of them had brook trout in it. So these, these are the, the four criteria needed to support brook trout. Now, if you go back up to the top, if you're at a lower elevation, i.e. warmer temperatures, we know mountains are colder than lower land areas, you're below that threshold. The next most important variable was forest cover. Again, shade and cool temperatures. Any stream or watershed that was above 64% forest cover had low pasture cover and again, a high quality riffle score. 34 streams met this criteria, 97% of them had brook trout in. So we see things popping out, elevation, which we can't change, but we can improve habitat and forest cover within the watershed. Another way of looking at the data, um, the figure to the right is just overall variable importance to this overall model. And the top four variables were altitude, forest, row crop coverage, and then percent greater than 20, which is the temperature readings for the use class three designation. Um, when I applied this model to a test data set, so I randomly selected from the 1100 streams, um, not knowing whether or not brook trout were present or not, and I predicted their presence based on these variables. And 83% of the streams that had brook trout were predicted to have them. So it's overall good accuracy of model fit. Um, and just one more thing, the utility of this model is to, to look at streams where brook trout have been extirpated or habitat conditions have improved, as well as look at streams um, where we want to reintroduce brook trout and apply this model to it to see if it predicts it present. Because we have limited source stock of broodfish to, to translocate. So we don't just want to sprinkle trout everywhere if they're going to be doomed from the get-go. So this, this is a precision tool to be able to isolate streams or sections of stream where we have the greatest chance for a successful reintroduction. And just looking at a couple of these variables individually, um, these are just cumulative frequency plots. So the y-axis on all four of these plots is zero through 100%. So if you're at one, that's 100% of all of our brook trout streams in the state. So if you look at elevation, the proportion of brook trout streams increases from zero to 100 meters and below, all the way up to 800. Um, we see over 50% of our streams occurring above that, that 300 meter threshold. Um, so obviously brook trout frequency increases with elevation. Looking at water temperature um, to the right, so that's the percent of water temperature above 20 degrees C. That red line is at the 20 degree C mark. 80% of our streams fall below that 20 um, degree mark there. So if you're, once you're above that threshold, you really run out of brook trout resources really quick. So we, we've kind of have thresholds there from a temperature standpoint. Again, looking at forest cover, the 64% came out on the regression tree. The bottom left plot, if you look at that curve, we see a huge break there rated about 65%. And our, the majority, 80% of our brook trout resources are above 64% forest cover. And then riffle quality, the last one I'm gonna talk about, that's just really a measure of, of riffle diversity, um, different size substrate available to the stream. It's just a quantitative way that MBSS surveys the riffles within a section of stream. We see 80% of our streams that have a riffle quality score above 10. So riffles are important you know, for um, red development and uh, rearing young fish. And this is another way to look at temperature closely. Uh, this approach is used to um, really evaluate uh, thermal resiliency of a stream as air temperature increases. So all the climate models we know are predicting increases in, in air temperature over the next 50 to 100 years, particularly in the mid-Atlantic. So we wanna know which streams are gonna be most susceptible to increases in air temperature. So we took the 1,145 records of data we had. Um, we, we calculated mean daily water temperature for all 90 days for each stream. And we paired that to the mean daily air temperature during that same time period. And this plot shows our brook trout present streams, which are in gray, and our brook trout absent streams, which are in black. And the orange regression line is the average of all those streams as it relates to the intercept of air value on the y-axis and the slope of the air-water relationship. And what this means is because the intercepts lower on the x-axis, that means that air temperature is not increasing water temperature 
in our brook trout streams as much as it is in our brook trout absent streams, the black dots. There's almost a five degree Celsius difference there in that relationship. So we can now look at term, thermal regimes or temperature profiles for any stream um, paired to air temperature and determine whether or not it's susceptible to increases in air temperature. And then that provides a context for, is this stream suitable for brook trout or are they going to be in trouble if air temperatures start rising um, pretty quickly? And I wanna, this gets at protection. Um, I wanna just mention these quick. One of the things under protection was working with MDE for TMDL development. And this is a, an approach we're taking. Um, let me scroll back up real quick just to refresh your memory on a plot. Um, this, this black and green one, that's the upper gunpowder watershed. So the green is where brook trout are present, the black is where they're not. So we're working with MDE on supplying them temperature data um, to essentially model the watershed to determine where um, temperature issues are going to be um, most important. In other words, where it's going to be too warm for brook trout. So they have um, flow data from a USGS gauge station above Pretty Boy Reservoir, and they're able to calibrate uh, mean summer flows uh, going back 40 years for the entire watershed. Um, the next phase then is to calibrate temperature um, because temperature times flow equals uh, thermal load and thermal load is what um, you know, predicts temperature in the stream. So we have over 45 temperature stations in the watershed. This calibration process is very time consuming. There's a lot of coding and, and computer work to be done. So far, we've were able to calibrate four of these sites. Um, but as you can see, um, the, the calibration fits very well with um, the observed versus the predicted data. So once we can predict temperature profiles throughout this watershed, uh, along with flow, um, we can uh, generate uh, restoration scenarios. And what that means is if we, if we look at this map and this is just, or sorry, this plot, this is all theoretical, but the blue bar to the right is our baseline scenario. That is currently temperature conditions in the upper gunpowder watershed. So the 90th percentile of, of all temperature readings is 21.4 degrees C. So that's above our use class three designation. We wanna get that to 20 degrees C. So what percent forest cover, <clears throat> excuse me, do we need to achieve that use class three protection in the watershed and potentially support brook trout reintroduction throughout there? Now, one unique about this watershed is the upper half of the the watershed is actually more degraded and there's less brook trout present, whereas they are present in the lower sections. And that's because the city of Baltimore owns a few tributaries that are almost 100% forested. But the idea is if they can thrive in the lower part of the watershed, any land use or habitat restoration improvement um, will hopefully support brook trout elsewhere in the watershed. So this is just an approach to take with our watershed uh, modelers and planners to inform policy and implement um, on the ground practices that will actually achieve progress. So the Upper Gunpowder River is our case study right now, but if we can apply this um, statewide uh, or even range wide, if you look at the map to the right, uh, that's from a paper back in the 2000s, um, looking at all the known brook trout patches throughout the Eastern range and over 75% of them um, are greatly reduced or extirpated with the exception of Maine and a couple of the New England states. So. There's a lot of work to be done on the ground. Um, so next steps with, the, uh, for, with our program, establish reintroduction guidelines using the modeling and the, uh, the, the genetic information. We're looking at potential research projects as well for genetic rescue in streams where effective population size is, is too low, um, i.e. genetic inbreeding is going to occur and the population's genetically doomed. Um, we're going to continue working with our watershed modelers, modelers and policy implementers to hopefully achieve progress on the ground and then, you know, echo this information to our local land managers. I, I mentioned earlier, we're already sending private land parcels in need of habitat improvements to our counties. We want to continue doing this and just hopefully get private landowners signed up and, and um, just improve habitat. So the big thing here is start decreasing known quantified risk. These are the number of acres that are unforested, the number of miles of stream that are pH impaired, you know, the miles of stream that cattle have access to as well. So 
um, just quantifying this and tracking our progress is our, is our path forward to hopefully in, improve brook trout habitat and range distribution in the state. And with that, I'll gladly take any questions. Excellent. Well, well, thank you, Dan. So anyone, if you do have questions, please put it in the, in the chat. Uh, so one question came in, uh, which practices would you give the most value to brook trout improvement planting buffers, cattle exclusion, fencing, stream bank restoration, forest management, others? Um, it's really case by case, but if I could just wave, wave my magic wand and carpet bomb the state overnight, I would plant buffers. Um, that's the single biggest um, issue facing brook trout. I mentioned, you know, we want to see the buffer zone in all our brook trout streams at least at 65% forest cover, um, ideally 75 to 80, because we don't know what climate change is going to do. Um, it's projected to be warmer. There's just a lot of land out there that doesn't have shading. People like to mow to the stream banks or plant crops to the stream bank or, or graze their cattle. And it's just, it increases temperature and sediment load and decreases habitat and anything downstream of there is affecting it. So we want to increase habitat. We have to connect these stream corridors through riparian coverage. Um, and then, I mean, all these things are good. Uh, there, there's acute issues too. You have a good brook trout stream where cattle have access to, obviously they need to be isolated and removed from the stream and, and being fenced out. Um, so that'd probably be my second priority. And then AOP, um, that's an issue, um, but typically AOP is an issue in a good stream already. So just, you know, it, it's important. We have to take out barriers, but there's also situations where, you know, you might have a, an invasive species below a barrier or a non-native salmonid that you don't want to mix with the population. So it's it's six and one, a half a dozen the other. We, we want to increase, you know, genetic uh, diversity within our stocks, but there's there's other things to consider as well. But I, I would go with planting trees and buffers protection. Excellent. Uh, another question in is, uh, to what extent does impervious surface factor into brook trout occurrence? Well, they don't like it. Um, <laughs> You know, it, it didn't come in the model, but one thing to consider is that as riparian forest or forest cover increases or decreases, impervious is decreasing. So they're kind of co-related in that regard. Um, there was actually a paper published probably 10 years ago now by our, our then leader of MBSS, but it showed that a 4% impervious cover actually resulted in uh, absence of brook trout. And there's work done in Pennsylvania out of Penn State that showed that issues can occur at as little as 0.5% impervious cover. Um, so yeah, it's it's right there with forest cover. We're, we're kind of, and if you got to cut me off, um, Craig, let me know, I can talk for hours, but you <laughs> spend all your time on improving existing habitat or preventing habitat loss. And those are two different things because we look at the state and we see, okay, we have I mentioned um, 1,000 kilometers of land, over 30% of that's unforested, or 40% really. We have all this potential in these watersheds to reforest and just make better what we have. That doesn't account for working with the counties and limiting land development and, and spread of imperfect cover, because we, we all know economic growth is the silver ticket in politics, but it's just not conducive to cold water resources. And, and I'll just I'll add too, there was a paper that came out of Western or the Northwest. So it was either Washington or Oregon, but there's some uh, chemical and auto tires that they link to uh, complete loss of salmon spawning that hasn't been tested yet in the East. Um, but one could conceive that if it affects another salmonid species that brook trout might also be susceptible. So all these issues are, are important. Temperature's the big one, shade the streams, you know, and, and protect groundwater, um, but impervious cover is, I don't know how we can stop that. <laughs> yeah, that's a, that's a good question. All right, we have uh, time for one more question here that came in. Um, it said, hold on. Uh, this is an awesome comprehensive look at brook trout in Maryland. Is the presence absence of uh, other wild trout considered in the model for brook trout populations? It says many places in West Virginia have good 
trout habitat. I'm gonna try to scroll, I'm having trouble scrolling. Yeah, yeah, yeah I, I see the question. You right? said I, I can't well, lax brook trout first. because of other wild trout competition. There you go. The short answer is no. Um, to back that up, you know, we do have pretty quality wild non native salmonid fisheries, brown and rainbow trout that our anglers pursue and buy licenses to fish and they've been existing for decades. So we're not in a position to really um, remove those fish from these fisheries. Um, it'd be suicide and it's really just not in our program goals. Um, we have done a couple case studies of brown trout removals from isolated headwater brook trout populations where they do coexist just to determine whether or not brook trout um, how they respond. Do they increase in abundance? Is, is brown trout causing any issues? Um, and there's really not any clear evidence. My opinion, and this is based on science um, from, through my literature searches, I don't really think, I mean, there is direct competition, right? Brown trout are going to eat brook trout, but brook trout are going to eat brown trout and their eggs. Brown trout seem to be more tolerant to land disturbances than brown trout or brook trout. So if there's brown trout moving in and those numbers are going up and brook trout are going down, usually you're seeing increased impervious surfaces, increased temperatures and decreases in forest cover all going on at the same time. So the, the competition factor is, is kind of at the bottom of our list of concern, but if we had data su to suggest it's an issue, then we would definitely address it. Excellent. Well, great. Well, well thanks a lot, Dan. I appreciate your participation on this. Um, feel free to people to continue to put questions in, but we're going to move on to across the Mason Dixon. Um, uh, real quick, Greg, I'll put my um, sorry my email. Yeah, no problem. I wants to follow up. Oh yeah, yeah. You can put it in the chat, and, and we can share your your email as well with participants. Okay. Um, but going across the Mason Dixon to talk about brook trout, uh, the state fish of Pennsylvania. Uh, we have uh, David Nyhard. He's the chief of division of fisheries management. Uh, with the Pennsylvania Fish and uh, Boat Commission, Bureau of Fisheries. Go ahead, David. Yeah, I'll pull my presentation up here. That was a great present presentation by Dan, and it's certainly going to be a tough act to follow, um, but I will do my best. So can everybody hear me? I'm assuming everybody can hear me. I've heard otherwise. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, thank you. So this presentation is, is, as I mentioned, Dan's presentation was, was great. Um, this is going to be more of a, a broader overview of what resources are available in Pennsylvania and some of the things that we're doing to protect what we have and some partnerships that we have in place to, um, you know, protect and restore and enhance the wild brook trout populations that our state currently has. So as mentioned, my name is Dave Nyart. I'm the Chief of Fisheries Management for our Fish and Boat, for the Pennsylvania Fish and Boat Commission. My duty is really uh, prior to being the chief, I was our agency's cold water unit leader, and most of my job was spent dealing with trout. But now I get to dip into warm cold water um, management as well. So it's it's exciting. Um, but personally, I grew up around trout, so it's good to be giving a presentation on brook trout. So a couple of things we'll discuss. I'll give a brief overview of brook trout. And when you see these next couple of slides, you'll probably think, yeah, I already know this, but I always like to include this just because you never know who's going to be in the audience and what kind of information they have and, and what they don't have. And then we'll discuss what, what wild trout resources Pennsylvania has, some of the primary threat, threats that we're concerned about, and then some programs that we have that are aimed at protecting and enhancing um, our state's wild brook trout resources. So first, what are brook trout? Uh, there's a picture of a brook trout there. Obviously, it, it's when you're dealing with freshwater fish, you're probably going to be hard pressed to find a better looking fish than a, a wild brook trout. It does go by a couple other different common names, hemlock trout, mountain trout, speckled trout, just names that we commonly hear locals and others refer to uh, in regard to when they're talking about brook trout. It is Pennsylvania state fish. It was adopted as our state fish in 1970. Also, it's, it's the state fish of many other states that fall within its native range. This is Pennsylvania's only native stream dwelling trout. Uh, we do have another native salmonid to Pennsylvania, the lake trout, but obviously as the name references, it's not native or it, it's not found in flowing water. Brook trout are native throughout Eastern North America um, from Western, Eastern Canada, I'm sorry, down South through the Appalachian Mountains. 
into Georgia. It is currently widespread and distributed outside of its native range. Like other states, um, they stock brook trout for recreational value, just as our states and other states in the Northeast have, have commonly stocked rainbow trout. And as the presentation that, you know, that, that Daniel covered, I mean, brook trout, the key thing is they require cold, clean water. And this is usually in areas where watersheds with high forest cover and very limited development, which in Pennsylvania, when you look at brook trout distribution, it, it, it's, it's found in areas that traditionally have these type of characteristics, which is most commonly encountered in a lot of our headwater stream systems. The lifespan of brook trout, uh, in, in general, brook trout are fairly short lived. You know, in Pennsylvania, I mean, this is data that was collected using, um, collected during our surveys of, of small freestone streams. In general, brook trout really don't live much more than five years of age and they reach sexual maturity anywhere between two and three years of age. So given that age, anywhere from four to five to six inches is when a brook trout becomes sexually mature in Pennsylvania. So traditionally, you know, if you encounter a brook trout in Pennsylvania and it, it's nine, 10, 11 inches in length, this is an older fish. You know, you're looking at five, six years of age and typically this fish is near the end of its life. Spawning occurs right now, mid-September through November. So if you were to be in one of these streams uh, this month and in the past months, chances are you would encounter some brook trout either um, making a red or setting on a red or, or getting getting ready to go through the motion. So typically September through November is when you expect to find brook trout spawning in Pennsylvania. So we, we often, you hear the term wild brook trout uh, and in Pennsylvania, when we talk about wild brook trout, what we're referring to is, is streams where trout found there have resulted from natural reproduction. So this doesn't take into account hatchery fish that may be collected or stocked by others. Specifically, when we're talking about wild trout, it's stream that it, it's, we're talking about trout that have resulted from natural reproduction. Also in Pennsylvania, um, by definition and for protection purposes, tributaries to wild trout streams are also classified as wild trout streams for the function as habitat for segments of the population, whether it's in a nursery water refuge area or just um, for the sheer fact that it, you know, it could be providing cold, clean water to that system, which is benefiting the wild trout. So that's important in Pennsylvania because when we identify a wild trout stream, much as, as Maryland does as well, there's an additional layer of water quality protection that is afforded to these stream sections. So not only the stream where the, the, the wild fish actually reside, but the tributaries are also afforded that same level of protection, which is, which is vitally important when you're trying to you know, protect the species on a watershed level. So as far as distribution of, of wild trout resources in Pennsylvania, and this map does include brook trout, uh, brook and brown trout, uh, wild trout populations. So in total, we've documented about 17,000 stream miles or nearly 5,600 streams that contained wild fish uh, in general. So 63 of the 67 counties in our state have wild fish. Uh, there's three counties that do, or four counties, I'm sorry, that do not. If you look at the map on the southwestern part of the map, there's Beaver, uh, Washington, and Greene County. And then Philadelphia County is the only other county where we haven't documented or officially designated a stream as a wild trout stream. But I will say at our last commission meeting that we had just two weeks ago, we presented a stream in Beaver County um, for designation in the past. So following it officially being designated, that will be down to only having three counties in the entire state um, where we've never documented wild trout. Specific to brook trout, you can see here the, the red ovals that are over top of the mouth. This is typically where, where we have our best wild trout populations in the state. We've documented wild brook trout on a little over 3,800 streams, which is nearly 10,000 stream miles. And, you know, hearing the presentation before this, it, it, in knowing Pennsylvania, um, these circles is generally areas where we have huge tracts of public land. You know, whether it's Department of Conservation, Natural Resources, State Forest, State Game Land, Allegheny National Forest, you know, really the key, as mentioned, is, you know, areas that are untouched or relatively untouched by man and, and left fairly intact and have, you know, intact forest and very little disturbance to the riparian areas of the watershed in general is typically where you're finding the most brook trout um, distributed throughout the state. 
I also wanted to throw this in there, just as kind of uh, another wild trout program that we have in the state. Because typically when people talk about coming to Pennsylvania to fish for wild trout waters, um, more likely than not, they're keying in on what we call our class A wild trout streams. So these are wild trout streams that meet a biomass threshold that support a wild trout population, a sufficient size and abundance to support a long-term recreational fishery. And there's different biomass thresholds uh, based on the species. So it, it's different for brook trout compared to brown trout, or if you're having a mixed population as well. As I mentioned, these are a subset of our wild trout streams and they truly represent the best of the Commonwealth's naturally producing fisheries. And very similar to a wild trout designation, if a stream is designated as class A, it gets another layer of increased water quality protection through our Department of Environmental Protection. So Wild trout waters, we automatically request the DEP redesignate to a minimum of CWF, whereas Class A waters, we take it one level protection higher and request that a high quality cool water fishes designation be placed on these. And again, it just makes it more difficult for um, activities to occur in these streams, whether it's discharges or you know permittings for stream access or stream crossing. Um, it makes the, it makes it tougher and puts a more uh, stringent stringent regulations on these. Um, so it's certainly a good thing for the for the resource. As far as distribution, um, right now we have nearly 1,100 stream sections or almost 3,000 stream miles in the Commonwealth that are designated as Class A. That's 56 of our 67 counties, and specific to brook trout. We have, as I mentioned, we have 1,100 stream sections um, in total. Of those 1,100, there's 612. So over half of all of our Class A streams are Class A based solely on the brook trout biomass. So that's pretty impressive. So there's almost 14, a little over 1,400 miles of flowing water in our state that harbor Class A wild brook trout streams or wild brook trout populations. In addition to that, we do have some that have sympatric populations. And in most cases, it's a mix of brown and brook trout. And by having a mixed designation, what that means is that, that both species are obviously present, but not but one species isn't making up more than 75% of the total biomass. And we have 140 stream sections that are managed as mixed wild brook and brown trout. And that totals about nearly 450 miles. So in total, you know, you're looking at 750 stream sections or nearly um, 2,000 stream miles in Pennsylvania that there's a very high probability if you fish these, you're going to encounter uh, brook trout as well. Uh, so it's just, a go again, it just shows the, the vast amount of resources that Pennsylvania still has when it comes to not only wild trout, but specifically brook trout. So what are the th some of the threats uh, that we think about to our, our brook trout resources? Again, really, it, it, Pennsylvania is no different than, than any other states where brook trout um, are found. You know, increased water temperature and habitat degradation are the two key things that really are, are going to potentially impact or will impact brook trout populations, regardless of, of what area of, of northeastern uh, United States you're in. So we have to take into account, you know, decisions that affect land use, water quality, and water quality, uh, or quantity, excuse me, along with climate change, are going to be the primary factors that, that determine the fate of Pennsylvania's wild brook trout resources. Um, we must work to conserve these streams that contain wild brook trout and protect their habitat and water quality. And, and really, you know, public education is the key. You know, there's a huge outreach component into this. It, it is certainly easier. Um, to maintain a wild brook trout stream than try and restore it after it's been degraded. And a lot of that is through public education, you know, working with landowners, you know, ensuring that they're leaving the riparian buffers intact, ensuring that, you know, they're keeping cattle out of the stream. You know, the, um, as I mentioned, it's a lot easier to maintain these than to dump a significant amount of money and effort into restoring them once they've already been uh, eliminated from the system. So here's a map on the right hand side that shows um, this is part of the Eastern Brook Trout Joint Venture project that's been going on for quite some time now that that Pennsylvania is is really involved with from the beginning is currently and still an active member in it. So as I mentioned, water temperature and habitat degradation are the two main things that are concerning when you're looking at 
uh, the primary threats to brook trout. And you can see on the map here that most of Pennsylvania does have some current risk of habitat degradation anywhere from low to very high. And if you're keying in uh, on the areas in red, this is the areas that we currently have is very high um, for degradation. Obviously you're looking at, at Northeastern, or I'm sorry, Southeastern PA, the Pittsburgh area, uh, Northwestern PA. And it's really just a combination of a bunch of different land uses. You, certainly when you get into uh, more urbanized areas is when you start, av start having, you know, the impervious soil, you have a, a drastic change in land use. You know, you get into some more of the South Central located areas. When you think of counties like, you know, Lancaster County, uh, you think of agriculture. So really depending on the location of the state is, is really what threat you're trying to look for and identify as, as what is going to be the factor that's going to uh, and could potentially significantly impact the current habitat that is there. So we feel that, you know, in most cases, fisheries monitoring will provide the necessary information to guide the future management decisions. So we do a lot of sampling in Pennsylvania and, you know, we, we do our best to monitor as many streams as we possibly can. And usually as you start seeing, you know, whether it's a change in species composition, whether, you know, more brown trout becoming present in the system, or you start picking up on some more um, warm, cool water, non-game species, you start seeing some of that transitioning into, you know, areas where you traditionally would have encountered black nose dace, you're starting to see more creek chubs. It's probably a pretty good indicator that you're having a change um, to the system, which is likely re a result of, of impacts by the land use. So as far as what is Pennsylvania doing specifically, um, last October, the October of, of 2020, our commission approved our strategic plan for the management of trout fisheries in Pennsylvania. This is a five-year plan. We usually do these every three to five years, depending on um, how many objectives we have and, and what goals we ultimately want to, um, to accomplish. This plan is, is for all trout fisheries. It does include um, stock trout, but a vast majority of the issues and strategies that's in this plan are specific to wild trout management. Uh, and like a lot of this stuff on here, this stuff is available on our commission's website. I can certainly provide links um, to others that can be distributed to the to the individuals listening to this presentation today. Um, so you can look at this in greater detail um, as you have time. But really the goal of the plan is to ensure adequate protection is afforded to Pennsylvania's wild trout resources, and that fisheries provided through the management of wild trout and stocking of adult and fingerling trout provide a high quality angling opportunities as we're very similar to Maryland, you know, we're driven by license sales. So one of our main goals, obviously, you know, we want to protect our resources, but in the same regard, we want to make sure that we're providing angling opportunities for individuals in Pennsylvania as well. The plan details 43 issues and 137 strategies to address these goals, but specific to wild trout management, there's 22 issues and 52 strategies that address the highest priority issues. So wild brook trout really are at the forefront of, of, of fisheries management in Pennsylvania. And, and when it boils down to it, they are the primary focus of our wild trout management uh, in the trout plan. As I mentioned, there's 22 wild trout issues in the plan. 17 of those 22 issues have a, have a specific brook trout focus. Um, and these are all detailed in the plan that won't be covered during this presentation. But again, that information is available on our agency's website. Anywhere from addressing climate change, you know, climate change is, is going to happen, you know, so the sooner we start thinking of ways to address climate change, the better. Uh, one of the key things in there that we often get asked is, you know, how are you basing your decisions to manage certain stream sections or manage a watershed in a certain way? And a lot of that is, is done through angler use and harvest surveys on our wild trout streams. And I hate to say this, but it's been nearly 20 years since our since the commission has had any type of statewide angler survey being done. The last time we had one specific to wild trout was 2005. So we're due for that and we're working to develop one of them because obviously, you know, that information certainly is what helps um, drive the direction of management of our wild trout resources. Habitat restoration. Habitat restoration is key um, to not only maintaining but um, restoring a lot of our brook trout streams in the state. Identification of new wild trout and class A streams. And this is important because 
And a lot of times when we identify a wild trout stream, it's the first time we've been there. So it allows us to gather some baseline data. But as I mentioned before, when we designate a stream as wild trout or class A, it's afforded a increased water quality protection as well. We're starting to really get into developing long-term wild trout monitoring programs. We do have some pretty good time series for a lot of waters in our state, but in most cases, they are, are more high profile streams on a statewide scale, um, a lot of streams we don't get to, you know, every once every 10, 15 years. So we're trying to really beef up our long-term monitoring program, really to track the status and trends of brook trout throughout the state. Another key thing we're working on is a stocking authorization. And, and this may seem like it's not really important to some people that, that view it this way, but for fisheries management, I think we are the only state in Northeastern United States that does not have some form of authorization in place that allows us to track and determine what species are being stocked in our waters. Currently right now, the agency has very little control and authority over what anybody wants to do as far as stocking. So there's very limit that's very, very few things in place that, that limits somebody from just up and stocking water stocking uh, trout into a wild trout stream. So by putting this authorization in place, it's gonna allow us to really better manage our wild trout resources. <clears throat> and the last thing I highlighted here is John Assess Waters Initiative. Um, and this is something I'm, I decided I wanted to dedicate a couple slides to because I think it's that important. And really when you're looking at, you know, where and, and what to do in, as far as protecting wild brook trout, it really comes down to three things. You have to know where they're at. So you have to identify um, and, and clearly be able to track the distribution of wild brook trout that, throughout the state. Next, you have to, once all this data is gathered, you know, whether you're collecting biological data, you're collecting uh, chemical data, you're collecting data on riparian areas, uh, aquatic passage, whatever the case may be, you need to have a way to prioritize where you're doing your work. And then the third thing is, once you've identified um, the data, prioritize it, you actually have to implement it. So those are really the three things that need to take place uh, to get you from point A to point B. So I, I mentioned the Honest Test Waters Initiative, and, and this is something, this program really started as a pilot program in 2009. Um, and I've been involved at, at some level with this program since its inception. So it, it, it's it's really on a statewide scale of Pennsylvania size, this is something that you know, really hasn't been done um, in most cases by other states. So the issue, why we, why we decided to take on the Onassess Waters Initiative is right now, Pennsylvania has about 86,000 miles of flowing water and that's second only to Alaska. So there's certainly Pennsylvania is blessed to have a vast amount of, of, of flowing water resources within the state, but also, you know, that's a lot of water and, and certainly we haven't had the opportunity to assess all that. Um, so prior to 2010, nearly 20,000 miles of the 86,000 miles were actually sampled by the agency. So you're looking at, at nearly 66,000 miles within the Commonwealth that data has never been collected on. And certainly when you're trying to accurately manage and, and track what's going on in the state, that's a huge data gap that we don't have. That's a lot of information that, that we were missing. So that was really the, the, one of the main driving reasons why the Onassess Waters was, was created. Um, to date, there's roughly 49,000 stream miles in Pennsylvania that haven't been surveyed. So prior to 2010, we did about 20,000 miles. After 2010, so over the last 13 years, um, you know, we've ramped up our sampling and almost doubled the amount of, of, of sampling that has been done in our state. You can see here of the 49,000 miles that are yet to be sampled, nearly 40,000 miles of those are, are small, small streams less than a mile in length. And really, you know, this is a lot of the areas where we would expect to find wild fish because in most cases, these are small first and second order streams that are likely, that are occurring in, you know, some of our more forested areas that just given the location, the information we have, it's become a high priority to sample these as well. So with the Honest Test program, really the proper classification through biological survey is the key to protecting these resources. Um, you don't know what's out there if you don't look and, and you don't know what to protect if you don't know it's there. So getting that baseline data 
is really the first step um, in, in providing protection to these resources. And as I mentioned before, when wild trout are documented in a stream, it does provide a layer of additional protection to that resource, not only to the stream itself, but to the riparian area and any wetlands that are associated um, with that stream. So in 2009 and even continuing, the ever increasing urbanization of Pennsylvania's rural regions, uh, the extraction of coal that's been in Pennsylvania for many, many decades and the recent expansion of natural gas throughout the much of the Commonwealth uh, was concerning. And it became pretty apparent that we needed to ramp up our sampling to accurately um, determine what wild trout resources were in Pennsylvania. So in 2009, as a more or less of a pilot program, uh, field biologists within the commission started shifting some of our priorities away from our other sampling that we were doing and focused on unassessed waters. But it became pretty, pretty clear pretty quick that the Fish and Boat Commission could not do this on our own. Um, just the limited staff, you know, we're a small agency. It is our Division of Fisheries Management, which does a lot of the sampling is small. I think it's with all of our full-time and seasonal staff, you know, you're looking at 50 employees and that's certainly not enough employees to cover a state as far as big as Pennsylvania. And we were concerned that, you know, the rate of stream, de stream degradation really exceeded our ability to properly classify and protect these waters. So we sat down as, as an agency and as a, as a group and pulled together some information using GIS, you know, looking at some of the things that were mentioned before, when you're looking at forest cover, you're looking at um, stream gradient and those type of things, and really decided that we need to prioritize where we were going to do some sampling um, in sampling within areas where we knew we would find wild trout and also sampling in areas that we felt were at the greatest risk of human degradation. So based off of that and knowing that our staff was limited on how much sampling we could do, we decided that um, the best thing for us to do was develop this program and partner um, with non-qualified commission entities to increase our sampling of waters and provide some adequate protection to these streams. And how we did that was, is we, we partnered with, as you can see on this screen here, mostly with colleges and universities. And we did, did partner with some NGOs, uh, Western Pennsylvania Conservancy and Trout Unlimited. And in this sense, Trout Unlimited, I'm, I'm speaking to the folks from National Trout Unlimited that are based out of Lock Haven. Um, so Sean Rummel and Amy Wolf, uh, those types of folks. Um, we did, you know, Trout Unlimited, you know, local chapter Trout Unlimited, they, they do participate in this, but they're not actually the ones out there collecting the data. They're more, you know, providing some additional data in, in areas to sample. But as far as the sampling goes, um, it was limited to these colleges and universities. The data was collected following all PFBC protocols using backpack electrofishing gear. And the data that they would collect um, ultimately, in, in the end, a report would be written and that stuff would be submitted. Um, we would propose of these waters to our board of commissioners using the data that's collected by others and, and have these officially be designated as, as wild trout waters. So there's two maps here. Um, so this is pre-2009 and you can see the roughly 86,000 flowing model, miles of waters in Pennsylvania. The blue lines indicate the sampling that was done. So if you remember before, prior to 2019, we had about 19,000 miles where we sampled. And most of these were our bigger systems, you know, our named streams. And uh, that left a significant amount of water that we haven't sampled. So as of 2020, when you look at the map, you can see that a lot of that red is now blue. So we doubled our sampling efforts and stream miles um, in the last 11 years. There's still a lot of work to do. As mentioned, there's still 49,000 miles of flowing water that yet to be sampled. But in most cases, these are small um, first and second order streams. Uh, but a lot of the named streams and the bigger systems in our state have been sampled uh, over the last decade. So as part of the Honest Test program, uh, one of the main information that they're collecting, they are collecting biological data determine the presence or absence of, of brook trout and wild trout in general. But additional information is also collected. They are doing some pretty coarse habitat um, scoring. They're looking at some of the land use that is occurring, um, taking water quality, water chem data. And they're also looking for areas where there's aquatic organism passage. So that really gets us to our next area is, our, our next point is that 
you have all this information and it's great to have this information, but you have to have a way to prioritize, you know, where to do your work. And the, the Fish and Boat Commission has partnered with Trout Unlimited, again, National Trout Unlimited, out of Lock Haven to help them develop this conservation portfolio. And it was done on a, a trial basis, looking at the Kettle Creek watershed and, and TU is currently expanding that statewide. Um, and we are working with them and that a lot of the data that they're using, especially the fish data and the biomass data um, is, is was data that was collected by the agency and passed on to them. But this again, just looks at, you know, it's nice to do this work, but you, when, you, when you take the time and the effort and you spend the money to do it, you wanna make sure that you're doing it in the ideal location. And there's certainly many factors that play into determining you know, where, where the work should be done. This map may be hard to read, and I, I apologize for that, but you can see the dots on here are, <clears throat> excuse me, areas where we identified um, aquatic passages and they're rated anywhere from very high to very low. You can also look at the trout biomass to get an idea of, you know, where you should direct your efforts to. But not shown on this map, it does show um, current land use. It shows um, the riparian areas and just different things that you can look at to determine where to best to do your habitat work. And really, you know, depending, the question was asked before, you know, if you had to do one thing to improve wild brook trout, would it be? And, and kind of as Daniel mentioned too, well, you really have to look on it, um, on an individual stream or individual watershed um, level to determine, you know, what is needed. And the tool like this conservation portfolio is what allows you to determine if, if something can be done and improved just by the riparian areas or riparian planning, if it's something that in-stream habitat has to be done, or, you know, is there a culvert, is there a barrier that can be removed, uh, allowing, you know, fish to move um, freely through that system. So this conservation portfolio tool is something that our agency, along with some of the other tools that we have, that really we use to prioritize where we're going to invest in doing conservation work. So the last part that I have, um, is you got the data, you analyzed all the data, you decided, you know, based off of, of the information you have, you made a priority of, of where you're gonna sample. So actually is implementing this. And this is something that our agency has really started doing. There's been a lot of work out there. There's been a lot of work done with aquatic organism passage through the NAC program, identifying where these barriers are. But I think we're really at the point now where we have the data, it's time to really put the boots on the ground and fix and address a lot of these passages. Um, so this example here is something that was done in, in 2020, um, Ock Fork, which is located in Lycoming County. So this would be North Central Pennsylvania. Ock Fork is a tributary to Upper Pine Bottom, which is then a tributary to Pine Creek, Big Pine Creek, the folks around here call it, uh, which would be in the Slate Run, Cedar Run area for, uh, for you that are familiar with that area. So this kind of just shows the partnership that we have not only with TU, but um, DCNR and really others. And this is just one example of a project that was done recently. So, <clears throat> excuse me, Trout Unlimited assessed the culvert that you can see here in the picture using the NAC protocol. So it's a North Atlantic Aquatic Conductivity Collaborative, Collaborative Assessment Protocol. And they determined that only two culverts are pictured here, but in total there were five culverts on this project. And every single culvert was classified as reduced or no aquatic passage. So knowing that this is a priority and this off work is, is in a watershed and is, um, it's, a, it's an allopatric population, meaning that only brook trout are present in this system and it's receiving water is a class A water. So again, this is dumping into one of our best of our best wild trout streams. So by removing this barrier, you know, we're creating additional habitat, additional um, you know, resources for the fish in upper pine bottom. Um, and subsequently we have gone back and sampled this stream and it has improved both in abundance and in biomass. But so once we, the, the culvert assessment has been done and we determined that it, it was a priority because of the reduced and, and no aquatic passage, we worked with the Department of Conservation of Natural Resources. So our, our DCNR, Pennsylvania DCNR, and they determined that it was in the best interest of the resource and for their, there was a trail that goes, that did go across this that the culvert should be removed, allowing the stream to be more free flowing in its natural condition. So we got the data, we got landowner buy-in, and it certainly is easier to work with landowners when it's on public land. Um, if 
if these types of projects are on private land, the Fish Commission is all for doing them, but we have to be open to public acting. You know, we're not going to go in and do private work uh, on a lot of these because, as we mentioned, you know, we're driven by angler sales, and it, it's a higher priority for us to do work in areas that are open to the public for sure. So where the Fish and Boat Commission came into this particular project was we funded the project, and a lot of the funds that, that were used to fund this project were through our, our recent voluntary permits funds. So it was permit voluntary permit sales. I think this started, I want to say three years ago, where angler buyers could volunteer to, or they, I'm sorry, they could, they could voluntarily donate money for specific things. And one of the things that the voluntary permits is the wild trout enhancement. So money that was raised during that was used to improve our wild trout resources. So as a result of this project, uh, as I mentioned, there's a total of five culverts that were removed from three locations. So the previous picture, it was under high flow, uh, and this one is, is certainly you know much lower flow, but you can see here that the culverts were removed and the stream was restored to more of its natural setting. Uh, in addition to the, cul the culvert removal, there was also not necessarily pictured in this picture, um, but the culverts that were downstream up here, some in-stream habitat was also done. So. This project required the removal of, of a culvert, and it also required some additional in-stream habitat and riparian buffers to be planted as well. And the result of this, uh, this one project moving these five culverts, you can see here that it opened up nearly four and a half miles of streams within this drainage. So, you know, looking at a watershed level, um, you know, that's all the stuff that has to be taken into consideration. I mean, you can remove a culvert, but if it's at the very end of a head, if it's at the very top of a headwater stream, it may be of a little value or lower priority than moving something down, removing something down in the lower in the system. So in this case, these culverts were near the, the mouth of, of Ott Fork, and it opened up four and a half miles of stream above it. And certainly open up conductivity or connectivity of these systems is critical to ensuring that, you know, we're providing an additional level of protection to the resources, uh, you know, within that watershed. And with that, that concludes my presentation. So I'm willing to take any questions that anybody may have. Excellent. That was a fantastic presentation. I'm, I'm blown away by how many uh, trout or wild trout streams there are in Pennsylvania. I keep forgetting about all that, but that's uh, it's astonishing. We can understand why you can't get into every single one. Um, so put your questions in the chat box. Uh, one question uh, that came up is, the, the, as you start to assess these streams and you start to give them designations, that sort of the class A, uh, do you get resistance from like, you know, counties or municipalities or so fearful of, you know, it being able to prevent development or, or actions in that watershed? We can. Uh, it, it's usually in, in most cases we don't. Um, how our agency works is prior to any of this being actually designated by our commission is put out for public comment and posted on what we have as a Pennsylvania bulletin, which is a website that allows people to go in and see what's being done. And then they can ultimately provide comments to our agency. But by and large, most of the time, all the comments we get are in favor and support of, of these class A and wild trout designations. We do get a couple, um, you know, every year, where some individuals are concerned, but by and large, we, we receive mostly positive support. Oh, excellent. Yeah, no, I was wondering alternatively, I mean, are there any kind of local jurisdictions that would embrace, you know, class A de designation as a way to draw in anglers in, in business? Yeah, yes, yeah, certainly. Um, you know, being where I'm located in central PA, it, it's certainly a selling point. You know, I know people, I'm blessed to live on the banks of Fishing Creek, which is, you know, in my opinion, probably the best best trout stream in the state. But again, I'm a little biased. You know, <laughs> it's not uncommon to see people that are selling homes around here include that in their posting that, you know, um, located near X stream that is a Class A stream or provides, you know, great recreational hanging opportunities. So it, it certainly is handled that way. And I know some local parks, um, not only in central PA, but along the banks of some of our other class A's that, you know, where they have a township or community park also advertise that as, you know, in one of their kiosks that they have as well. Oh, fantastic. That, that's encouraging. Uh, one question. Came I, I will, Go ahead. I, I was going to say that um, 
how our agency works is we have four quarterly commission meetings every year, and it's usually uh, January, April, July, and October. And prior to those meetings is when our, all of our designations, whether it's a wild trout or class A designation, are usually open for public comment. So I would encourage folks, um, if it's of interest to you, by all means, submit a public comment, uh, either in favor or opposed, you know, whatever your opinion is. Certainly, we, we appreciate the public comments we receive. Excellent. Uh, one question came in is, uh, is the Fish and Boat Commission adding coarse woody debris into streams to boost habitat in occupied streams? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, yes, um, we, we do. We do do that. We work with DCNR, Department of Conservation and National Resources, um, with our local foresters, and we've identified areas in the state where we feel that woody debris uh, would benefit. So we have done that. That's something we started doing. I would really say probably four or five years ago, but we've ramped it up over the last two years. Oh, excellent. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, the, the question about, you know, the, the map of wild trout streams, and the lack of them in southwest Pennsylvania, was that because there weren't native brook trout in that area or was it the, the coal mining or what were the activities? Why are there no uh, wild trout streams in that part of the state? It's really a combination of both of those things. You know, when you look at the native distribution, that that area, southwestern PA, that Greene County, that Washington County, that's really on the fringe of where brook trout were found historically. Okay. Uh, as most people know, you know, that part of the area, as with other parts of the area, has certainly been impacted uh, by mining. So there's certainly a lot of, of, of man-made issues that are limiting um, the wild brook trout and just wild trout resources in that area. Excellent. Okay. Um, any other questions? Folks have? Well, well, excellent. We, we will certainly, actually, if you don't mind, send that strategy out. That's, that sounded interesting to any participants um, to read what uh, the Fish and Boat Commission are doing on the cold water fisheries. But it, that, that was excellent. So I do want to take time to say thanks uh, to our presenters and thanks for participants coming in. Um, one of the big emphasis on there was uh, riparian forest buffers. And that's one thing that the Alliance does a lot in, in Pennsylvania uh, and Maryland as well. So um, we work with the, the public programs, the farm bill programs, but also we have our own grant money to do some riparian forest buffer work. So feel free to reach out to us and we can send some information out as well. So we're always looking for land to plant buffers. So be a great connection. Um, so on that, we, we will send the posting of this recording out um, as soon as we have that up. But again, thanks, David, uh, for participating tonight. Thank you. And I can certainly email you those links to some of that stuff that was covered in that presentation. And um, you can distribute as you, as you see fit. No, that would be great. We appreciate that. Okay. Well, thank you, everyone. And be, be, if you're interested in whitetail deer, we, uh, it's our last session next week. We're doing next Wednesday. Uh, we're discussing both in Pennsylvania and uh, in Maryland, the uh, whitetail deer. Thank you very much.